of Shiloh Baptist Church, one church in two locations. I am so glad you decided to join us. Check out our program, check out our viral worship, check out our church in general. There are a lot of great things happening at Shiloh. Please go to our website and see some of the great activities that we are doing here uh, in our area. Some of the things that we are doing to reach people for Christ. We are a kingdom church who believes in kingdom building, who is helping to change people's lives. Check out the message today. Go to our website. Check out our other messages. We are so glad to make you a friend of Shiloh Baptist Church. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, have a blessed day. God up, so I need you to prepare to go with me to a very 
uh, familiar but powerful passage of scripture. Uh, there's a word today. Someone get ready. Hit someone. Call them up. Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you have to go. Let them know there's a word they're going to need that's being delivered right now at Shiloh Baptist Church. Go with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Thank you, musicians. Our musicians play so wonderfully and give me that preacher feel while I'm getting ready to go where I'm going. I'm again glad you tuned in and chose us to be a part. We don't take it for granted that you're here at the Shiloh Ministry site getting the word of God for today. Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 22. There it is, Genesis 32. I'm going to begin reading at verse 22. If you have difficulty finding the book of Genesis, I'm going on without you. Genesis 22 from the King James Version. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford of Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had. And Jacob was left alone there and wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let thee go except you bless me. And Jacob said unto him, and he said unto him, unto Jacob, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him, said, tell me, I pray thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Let's pray right now. Will you bow with me? Oh God, we praise you and thank you for this day and for the joy of another day. And as someone is listening to feed and nourish their hungry spiritual soul, allow this word to be exactly what they need it. You're that kind of God, Lord. From your celestial throne on high, you look down and supply a need even before we know we need it. So right now, God, we're counting it as done. We're counting a victory that's come already because of who you are and what you've done. In the matchless, marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. Pray. Amen. For as long as the Spirit will allow, I'm going to speak from this thought. I want you to get it deep down in your spirit. Keep struggling. Your blessing is coming. Keep struggling because your blessing is coming. Can I say that again to put the emphasis where I need to put it? Keep struggling. Your blessing is coming. Let's talk about this. We are living in some very tough times. These times have people struggling a lot more than they normally do. Life has always uh, permitted us or presented us with challenges and with things that we've had to struggle through situations. But 2020, my God, is going to go down in history as a year that radically changed our world and the way that we live. What am I talking about? It has changed our in us in the areas of making a living. Something as simple as making a living. It has changed us in the areas of uh, important milestones. It has changed us in the areas of looking at how we do everyday activities. Let me, let me get to this. So what am I talking about? How is making a living? Uh, unemployment is at an all-time high. Joblessness seems to be going up and growing off the hook. Many people are signing up for unemployment benefits. People are struggling, struggling, I said, to pay their bills. Why are they struggling to pay their bills? Big companies that were household names are now going out of business. And little companies that 
may never recover from this pandemic. And that government stimulus check uh -huh, that you were depending on sometime is too little, too late, and can't pay your bills. So folks are struggling with the bills, not only in areas struggling with the bills, but making or important milestones. You know what kind of important milestone? School. How many of us know growing up our socialization, the important things in our life as we were younger came through when we were at school. We learned who we were. That's where at school we had proms and we had our graduations and we had our football games and we had homecoming and we played sports and all of these things some young folk have missed because of the pandemic and they'll never get them back. They're important milestones in our life. Or registering for college and going on the campus and filling out or furnishing your dorm room. Those are some of the important milestones we miss. And then also everyday stuff. I'm talking about something as simple as dinner and a movie, which used to be my relaxing point, where I could go out, have dinner without worrying about a mask, someone coughing on me. We could sit where we want and socialize and watch this sports, playing sports and watching sports have all got people struggling and overwhelmed during this time and the worst one at of all is church i'm not even talking about the cultural the cultural thing that turns us on of high-fiving i can't even high-five my brother and not only get a high-five i can't go to church and hold hands and worship god anymore i can't even look over tell your neighbor tell your neighbor you can't do that anymore your neighbor might run you out the church all i'm saying is this is a time of struggling what do i mean what do i mean by struggling this is a time when people are overwhelmed by their struggles. But have I got some good news for you this morning? Have I got a word for you this morning? This message was dropped in my heart right out of the Spirit of God where God wanted me to tell you that the only reason you are overwhelmed today is because you don't understand the value of real struggling. You have no idea that it is not the good times in our life. It is not those easy times in our life, but it is those times that we struggle that gives us our greatest blessings. And folk need to understand when we struggle, that's when we turn out to be stronger. You heard the German philosopher uh, uh, Nietzsche who said, German philosopher Nietzsche said this, he said that we need to understand, I know you've heard this old adage, it says, whatever does not kill you makes you stronger. Frederick Nietzsche knew what he was talking about. He was just saying, if I make it through it, I come out better than I was. In 1857, one of the most important black men in our history, Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, the reformer, the orator, the great orator was speaking at the West Indies celebration of slavery ending in the West Indies. And his speech that he spoke has been quoted over and over again. There were two lines in that speech that people say are still relevant because they hit the core of understanding what it means and the benefits that we get through struggle. And what did he say? Down in his message, Frederick Douglass said this, and if it was today, Frederick Douglass' message would be going viral because here's what he said. He said, where there is no struggle, there is no progress. You've heard it before. Frederick Douglass said, where there is no struggle, there is no progress. All he was trying to tell us is that if we don't learn to accept face and go through struggles, there is no promotion. There is no progress. Anything we want to receive has to come through struggle. How many know that anything worth getting that I got from God comes through me struggling where I am? It may look easy when you see folk in church at the celebration moment, but don't you think they haven't cried a little bit at night? Don't think they haven't prayed when you weren't looking. Don't think there were some doubts they had to cast down when wasn't anybody looking. But God is telling us that before we can get progress, before we can get to the blessing, before we can grow, we have to learn this. Struggling is just a part of God. As a matter of fact, when you get to a blessing, you'll learn how to celebrate 
all those times of struggle that you go through. God said in his word, James tells us in the first chapter, verse 2 through 4, he said, my brethren, count it all joy when you go through diverse temptation, knowing that the trying of your faith is working progress or working patience. Let patience have her perfect work so you can be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. David. The king, David, the poet, David, the soldier. David said in Psalms 119, with all of his love to God, in Psalms 119, verse 71, David said these words. It was good that I was afflicted. Now I learn your word. Here's what David said. Before I was afflicted, it, your word didn't benefit me. Your word didn't lift me. Your word wasn't rhema to me. But after I got afflicted, man, I learned how to pray. I learned how to connect with you. I learned how to call on you, God, and you showed up in my life. How many folk out there know it was during those dark nights that you had a prayer and a praise party all by yourself that's when the blessings of God came into your life. And then Apostle Paul said these words in 2 Corinthians 6, 4, and 5. He said, in everything we do that establishes us as servants of God, he said the first thing that counts is we patiently endured our troubles. He said we went through hardships and difficulties. He said we were locked up. We were mobbed. We were jailed. We, we went without food. We were hungry. We were overworked. But it was during those times that the Spirit of God became alive in my life. I'm trying to tell you this morning, let's flip the script. There's a blessing in your struggle. There are some things that struggle does that nobody else could do. You know what struggle does? Struggle brings me hope. If I'm struggling through, it means I still believe I have a future. Struggle makes me strong. When struggling is there and I keep struggling, as long as I'm moving, I get a new strength added to my life. I'm not the only one who has gone through some stuff and said, I don't know how I made that through, where I got the strength from. But hallelujah, it's because I learned how to struggle. Struggle gives me confidence. Here's what struggle makes me say. I got through last time. Somebody here is out right here. I can get through this time. I'll tell you again. Because somebody is stuck right now thinking they're not going to make it through. But my brother and sister, the Spirit of God is telling me to tell you, you're already through. If you got through last time, you're going to get through this time. You just have to have that confidence in God. Struggle gives me compassion. You know why I don't talk about my brothers and sisters when they fall? Uh-huh. It's because I fell. Once you had to struggle your own self, you're not out there talking about what's going on in somebody else's life. You're too busy trying to hold your own life up. So what struggle does is make me know I need to have compassion on that sister. I need to have compassion on that brother because I, they don't even know what I just went through. Way worse than what they did. All I want you to know is struggle. God uses struggle. There's this poem. I know you heard it that I love, and it's an unknown poem. And I'm going to read it so you can hear it, because I know you heard it before. But look how God uses struggle. It says, I asked God for strength. God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked God for wisdom. God gave me problems so I could solve them. I asked God for prosperity. God gave me brawn and a brain to work things out. I asked God for courage. Are you getting this? God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked God for patience. God placed me in situations where I was forced to wait. Oh, my God. God, I asked God for love. God gave me troubled people to love. I know somebody don't like that one right there, but God was trying to teach me love by giving me the most difficult people in the world there was to love. But look at how this unknown poet ended this. He said, I received nothing I wanted, but I got everything I needed and my prayers were answered. There is a blessing in your struggle. Jacob, this text, Jacob, his whole life was a struggle. From the beginning to the end, him grabbing onto Esau's foot, trying to come out of Rebekah's womb, it was a struggle. Jacob knew how to struggle. But what's good about this text, 
And what we're going to learn today is instead of throwing him away, God came down and wrestled with him. That's good news, y'all. God is not going to throw you away. He'd rather come down, show up, have a face-to-face -face with you than to just throw your life away. So God is saying, Jacob, I'm coming. I'm not going to throw you away because you learn. Or you're going to have to go through and understand the value of struggle. His brother was trying to kill him. His uncle was tricking him. He was out there all alone in another land, all because he learned struggle. But if we go to verse 26 of this text, verse 26 gives us an insight as to where we're going. And then we're going to take off into this text. Verse 26 says this, the man who was wrestling with him said unto him, uh, you have to, at this point, let me go. It's almost morning. And Jacob replied back, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Did you hear it? He said, I'm not going to let you go. See, what he's saying is, I'm going to keep struggling until I get what God promised me. I'm going to keep struggling till I make it to that next promotion. I'm going to keep struggling until I can lay down at night and have peace in my life. I'm going to keep struggling till God places a new heart on the inside of me. Here's what he said. Keep struggling. Here's the good news. Your blessing is coming because there's a blessing in your struggle. Write this down with me so you can go with me into this text and we'll fly through it. First of all, you need to struggle because God promised. Keep struggling because God has made you a promise. Keep struggling because God has made you a promise. Keep struggling because you, you need to struggle through the pain. Hmm. Let's say that again. Keep struggling because God has made you a promise. I, I got somebody. You need to learn how to keep struggling even through the pain. That's when you want to give up. And thirdly, you need to keep struggling because there is prosperity coming in your life. God has already provided providence. Keep struggling because God promised. Keep struggling through the pain and keep struggling because God has promised providence. Let's look at this text. Uh, I want to give you another side of Jacob. We've all heard, and I know if there's any Bible teachers out there, or any theologists out there, theologians, excuse me, you know you've heard that Jacob was a trickster, Jacob was a supplanter, that Jacob, you know, was an ornery kind of guy because he stole his brother's birthright and because he stole the blessing. But I want to show you biblically another side of Jacob. Jacob not only didn't just steal his brother's birthright, Jacob really, everything he did was motivated by him wanting to see the Abrahamic covenant come to pass. You're going to find out in this text. He was making sure what God promised Abraham was going to happen. Jacob was the second son of Isaac and Rebekah, but he was the third of the four patriarchs needed to bring forth the Abrahamic covenant of God. The fourth one was Joseph, who was on the way. But Jacob stepped up and became that third patriarch. When he was born, Esau was hairy, and, and he was covered with hair and red all over and rough. And he became a hunter and a woodsman. And he became Isaac's favorite because he would go into the woods and catch the meat that Isaac used to love. And then Rebecca said that Jacob was her favorite. So Jacob would sit around. You know he was cooking his brother the soup. He learned how to cook and hang around and read the scriptures. And Jacob had a different exterior than Esau did. And we found out that he went in orchestrated by Rebecca. He not only stole his brother's birthright. He didn't steal it. Esau gave it up because he despised it. But he stole it as the scripture said. And he got the blessing orchestrated by his mother. They tricked his father whose eyes were getting them. Well, when Esau the hunter found out that his brother had stolen his blessing, which went to the firstborn, he said, I'm going to kill him. Rebecca heard about it, got Jacob out of town, sent Jacob in to live with Laban, who was his bro her brother, his uncle. So he went to live with Laban, and he said, look, you go settle there so your brother don't kill you till things calm down. He said, and I want you to marry. Well, Laban had two daughters. 
He had Rebecca, excuse me, he had Rachel and Leah. Leah was the oldest, but Jacob, when he got there, fell in love with Rachel. I don't know why, but the text does say that Leah was tender-eyed. I don't know what tender-eyed mean. I don't want to say it means ugly or anything, but there was a preposition after tender-eyed that said Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful. Maybe that's why Jacob didn't want her, because she was tender-eyed. I, all I know is that Laban said, no, Leah is the oldest. You can't marry her sister. It's not right to marry the older, to marry the younger before the older. The only way I would do that is you work seven years for me. He decided, I want Rachel. I'm going to work those seven years. He did. As he worked those seven years, at the end of them, his uncle Laban tricked him and sent Leah, old tender-eyed Leah, into the tent that night. He slept with her, so I guess her eyes didn't make that much difference. And then he got out, he was angry, and his uncle said, you now have to work seven more years if you want Rachel. He decided that I'm going to work those seven more years because I want Rachel. Well, then that's what happened. He began to work, but in the interim, Jacob started having kids. He now had two wives, and now he had 13 children. What am I saying? Leah, his first wife, gave him four sons. Then later, she gave him two more sons and a daughter. So Leah had seven children. Rachel, the last two sons were born by Rachel, and Rachel had two Two sons and those two sons uh, added up to them having nine children but then two by Bildad who was Rachel's maid and then there was two by Zilpah who was Leah's maid. What I'm telling you is Jacob had 13 children by four different women and it was okay but we'll talk about that in another sermon. Let's move on. So it found out that he had 13 children and the 12 sons of the tribe of Israel were born. Well after working Jacob said look I'm yearning for home. I need to go back home. And he went to Laban and Laban didn't want to let him go. He said pay me off. He said how much I owe you? He said you don't have to pay me in money. He said I want you to pay me in livestock. So he said, look, I will take just all the speckled and the spotted cows and goats. Let them be mine, and you can have the rest of them. Laban agreed. Laban took all the speckled and the spotted out and said, we're going to start all over. Well, God intervened. Watch me, y'all. If you read that text, God intervened, and he showed Jacob in a dream how there were going to be more speckled and spotted cattle. And the next thing we know, Jacob is rich. So Laban really didn't want him to let him go then. Then his Laban's sons got angry, so he took off and snuck away. Laban caught up with him. But when he caught up with him, God intervened and they made a covenant. So he was fine. But as he was leaving with his two wives and with all of his goods and with all of his kids, he found out his brother Esau was coming too. Here it is. Jacob was heading home. Esau was heading toward Jacob. Jacob was tired. He had been tricked and messed up all his life. And where we are right now in this text is what Jacob did. How we got here was Jacob sent his servants and his wife on ahead of him to meet Esau. Because the text tells us about how he keeps struggling because they promised him. Verse 22, he arose that night. Took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. He took them over the brook and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone to wrestle with a man of God. How Jacob got alone was out of fear, out of frustration, out of struggling. Can you see it? Esau was coming. He had just fought off Laban. Esau's coming. You know, Esau said he was going to kill him. And the servant said, Esau got 400 men. I want you to see Jacob while he was alone. He was left alone because he sent everybody out. He said, take these gifts. Maybe Esau will forgive me. But he got by himself and sat down on a rock. The beginning of this chapter. I can see it. He was frustrated. He was wondering, when is my struggling going to stop? Have you ever been to the place that you wonder, when is my struggling going to stop? He got to the place where he was sitting there. I believe the crickets were chirping and he was sitting on a rock. And you know, sometimes we can look like tough Tony in front of other folk. But I believe Jacob was almost at his breaking point. But the text said, 
as he was thinking, my brother tried to kill me, my uncle has tricked me, I don't know if my wife and children are saved. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, a man, we know it was God, grabbed him. And Jacob's first instinct was to fight. I like that. Let me stop there and tell you something. Jacob said, true to my nature, I'm not laying down somewhere. I am a fighter. What am I talking about? Jacob was the kind of guy you do not want to play cards with. I know y'all don't know nothing about talking about, you know, spades and all that, but you do not want to sit down and play with Jacob because Jacob not going to hear about losing. He is not the guy you want on your team because Jacob is a fighter. He wants to win. He don't want you dropping the football in an open catch. He don't want you missing the baseball in the left field. He doesn't want you shooting too many open baskets and don't make them. He wants you off his team because he's a fighter. But I'm going to tell you why. It was born in him. It was his DNA. What are you talking about? Jacob and Esau were fraternal, not maternal twins. Fraternal twins are twins that actually have come from two different eggs and two different sperm in the same womb. Fraternal twins don't look alike. That's maternal twins. That's identical twins. Identical twins are twins who come from the same egg and it was split. And so that is not what they were. You know the text said that uh, Esau came out all hairy and rough and red hair and, and Jacob came out all smooth. That's because, and so here's the importance. Jacob had one temperament. His temperament was to throw away his birthright. Jacob was a fighter spiritually. Esau wanted to fight in the world. Don't miss that. Esau was the kind that could tell off everybody, cuss folk out. But when it came to a spiritual battle, he could not hold his ground. But Jacob was the kind that said, I want my stuff. Their DNA was different. That's where I'm going. I'm going on a point here. Some of you need to realize none of us in here who are believers have a reason to quit. None of us can justify quitting because just like Jacob and Esau, Jesus Christ is our brother who was our firstborn of all the brothers. Let me take you to the Bible. Romans 8. 29 said we were born to be conformed to the image of his son and that he was the firstborn from the dead. What that means is that word firstborn that they use or theologically is the word prototokos, the Greek word prototokos. Prototokos means this. It means that there was a blood transfusion. Oh, I'm about to make somebody shout. You know why you can't give up, my sister? You know why you can't give up, my brother? Because along the way, somewhere, Jesus Christ is my fraternal twin. I got his DNA. I got his blood running through my body. Somebody said the power is in the blood. All I'm saying is when Jesus died on the cross, we became spiritual brothers and sisters. He's my savior, but he's also my spiritual Brother, what that means is I now have the same power. You didn't hear John, you didn't hear, you didn't hear Jesus talking about it in John when he said, the works that I do, you can do also. And greater works than these can you do. All I'm saying is we have that power. Didn't you hear the scripture says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think. You know why you can't get struggling? Because you now have that same power that Jesus has inside of him. You know what it is? You can do more than you can ever think about doing. I know I have a witness out there that will testify. I done been through some things that I did not know I was able to get through. Are there any victorious people out there that said there was a night I thought I was going under. I thought it was over. But on the inside, my DNA rose up and I began to fight just like Jacob. And then there is a name in the name of Jesus. We have power in that name. Do you know it says that his name is able to, every knee has to bow. You know why you have a bow and go under in your latest trial? is because when you start speaking that name of Jesus, your trials, you didn't see it, but your trials, you didn't see the demons running, but you were just saying Jesus and you were praising him. And when that name went into the atmosphere, oh, help me somebody. When that name shot into the atmosphere, there was power in the name. Then there were some days where not only did I have to use it to fight, 
had to use it to go hide. You know, the text says that he is, his name is a strong tower where the righteous can run into and hide. How many of y'all know there's some nights I just hid out? <laughs> I guess somebody know what I'm talking about. It was too bad out here. I found me a name of Christ. I found my secret place and I hid. You know, I told God, Lord, protect me till the morning. And because I am his fraternal twin and because he likes to fight, he instilled in me this fighting so I could make it through that night. And finally, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, it says that, and you shall receive power. All I know is we have power. So don't you tell me you had to struggle. No. Esau gave up because that was in his DNA. Jacob gave, fought because Jacob said, that's my DNA. All I'm telling you is, who are you? Are you Jacob or are you Esau? You got to make up your own mind. Then the other part of this text says, that he, I'm still on the first point, look, it says that he fought because of the promise. Understand something, if we go to Genesis chapter 25, and if we look at around verse 23, we'll find these words there. It says, when Rachel Rebecca was pregnant, it says there's two nations in your womb. There's two kinds of people in your womb. I just told you, either Jacob or Esau. He said, and one shall be stronger than the other. But then there was a promise. Don't miss this. This one I'm going to tell you why you got to see another side of Jacob. It said, and the younger is going to rule over the older. Wait a minute. How did Jacob have the tenacity to stand there on that rock and wrestle with God? It's because he was wrestling for the promise that he heard. All I'm telling you to do is keep wrestling for your promise that God has given you. He was wrestling for his promise. What do you mean? It means that he knew that text. I believe that Rebecca, because he was her favorite, I believe Rebecca, while Jacob was hanging around the house, Rebecca told him about the promise that she got from God in the womb. And I bet you Jacob was running around and saying, well, if the older, if the younger is supposed to rule the older, then I want my promise. And I'm going to do it, whatever I got to do to get it. So if Esau doesn't want his promise, then I'm going to take it because I want it. I'll go even better than that. Do you know the Bible tells us in the text, if we go to Genesis, it tells us that Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac, the promised child, was born. We also know that Rebekah and Isaac were also barren. And so Isaac was 60 years old when Esau and Jacob were born. And we also found out that not only was he 60 years old, that means that Abraham must have been 160. Are you still with me? So Abraham was 160. And Genesis, or Genesis tells us that Abraham did not die until he was 185 years old. Genesis 25, 7. So if Abraham didn't die until he was 125 years old. That meant he had 15 years to talk to his grandson and give him the promise. What I'm telling you is Jacob got that promise day after day in his life and it messed him up. And you want to know how I know that I know what I'm talking about? Go to Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, and go to verse 8. It says this, by faith, Abraham went to a country where he was not supposed to be going. Watch this. And it said, but he sojourned in a land and dwelled in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were all part of the promise. Let's say it again. So it didn't say he dwelled in a tent with Esau. The Bible said he dwelled in a tent, Hebrews 11 and 7, with Jacob and Isaac. Can't you see the picture? Granddad and dad and young Jacob start talking about the promise and the word. And Jacob heard day after day how he was 100 years old and he was too old to have a child. But by faith, God came through. Faith started ushering in in Jacob's spirit. Jacob started running around thinking, by faith, I can get anything from God. Abraham shared it with him. That means for 15 years, he said, sat at the foot of his grandfather and said, I'm going to hold on to the promise of God. He held on to the promise so the promise would make sure that it was inside of him. What am I telling you? I'm telling you that the promise ought to ring in your spirit. I'm saying late at night, the promise ought to tell you, hold on, greater is 
is he to send you than he to send the world. I'm telling you, late at night, there ought to be a promise that comes to you and tells you, my God is going to deliver you. He is a healer. He is a way maker. He is a deliverer. He won't let you down. He never has failed you. And you're going to get to the point where you understand what Jacob understood. And that was that he was standing on the promise. The promise ought to be ringing on those times you're struggling. You ought to hear a word that comes forward to bless you. What am I talking about? Uh, a pastor and his wife were invited over one of their church members' house on a Sunday afternoon for dinner. And when they were invited to go to dinner on that Sunday afternoon, the little girl was there after they enjoyed a nice meal. She said, I want everyone to come outside and see me jump with my rope. So they all went outside with her and her jump rope. And they were all sitting around. And the little girl took one jump and the rope got tangled up in her foot. So the pastor said, let me demonstrate how you're supposed to jump rope. So the pastor got out there and jumped one time and put the girl's feet in the right position. And as they were jumping, the little girl jumped once. And all of a sudden, everybody watched and start clapping. I mean, they were clapping and cheering for her. Then she jumped twice without missing. They started clapping. Yay! Then one, two. Three, four times she jumped all by herself. By the time she jumped seven consecutive times, she said, okay, y'all, I want to run over and tell Debbie, my friend, I want to show her I can jump. So they all sat back down, and the little girl went around the corner of Debbie's house, but she came back about 15 minutes later, face all dejected, dragging her rope on the ground. The mom said, honey, what's the matter? Did you mess up? Could you jump? She said, mommy, I can do it. But I just need a whole lot of clapping while I'm doing it. All I'm telling you is God is up in heaven clapping while you're holding on. When you're sitting there and tears are coming down your aisle, I want you to hear God cheer thee and say, don't give up. I want you to hear God say, it'll be over after a while. I want you to hear God say, keep struggling. You don't have to work. All I'm telling you is God is always standing on your side cheering you. And just like this little girl, if you make one good move. Hold on a minute. God starts clapping. Hold on five minutes. God starts clapping. Because God loves you enough. You just got to make up your mind. It says he wrestled with him to the break of day. He said, I'm not going to let go till I get my promise. The second point is we found out the man looked at him and said, look, it's almost daybreak. You got to let me go. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Watch this. You know what he did? He grabbed him. And pulled a shank out of his thigh. Understand this. Here's what happened. He decided that he was going to put some pain on Jacob. You know what the devil does? When the devil see you jumping around too much, when he see too much joy in your life, when he see you making it too easy, he throws in pain. He throws in something that makes you think you're not going to make it. You better hear me because all of us better understand something. We better learn to deal with pain. Pain is just a part of this journey on this side. Pain just means God is still working in my life. We better learn. I mean, we look at stuff and think stuff is easy. It has never been easy. Let me give you the picture. You know how you see sometimes on a movie, or maybe you've been in a hospital see it, not lately because of the pandemic, but there's a mother sitting there with that beautiful newborn baby. And the baby's been lotioned down and smelling all hospital good and sitting in the mom's lap. It is the perfect picture of preciousness. But can we rewind back to the delivery room? You, you might see this pretty baby here, but how many know there was some struggle going on in that delivery room? As a matter of fact, I got some experience right here. Let me tell you what happened with our firstborn. I'll never forget it. Marcia and I, as all young new couples do, we had gone to childbirthing classes. So we were sitting in there, and in those classes, they teach you to pant, pant, blow, blow. <laughs> teach you how to breathe. <laughs> so I'm up there. I'm the coach. That's what they call us, the coach. So I remember sitting in there, those pains start hitting Marsha, and I was grabbing her, and I said, honey, pet, pet, blow, blow. And I remember she was sitting there, and she was squeezing, cutting off my blood, and I said, honey, and another pain hit her. She looked up at me and said, shut up, you breathe. I'm already breathing. She said, I ain't doing no more pet, pet, blow, blow. Hold on. And she grabbed my arm, and I just shut up. Because the pain, can somebody 
somebody say the pain is real. It might be a beautiful baby coming later, but you have to stand through the pain. Jacob was sitting there that night, and he decided while this man had him in pain, he said, I'm not letting go. Do I have somebody know what I'm talking about? Until you bless me. I'm not going to quit till I get what I know is mine. And they were shaking him. And the devil likes to shake him. There are three struggles, major struggles, that everybody has to go through in order to handle the little struggles in your life. Go with me. It's right there in the text. Because here's what Jacob had learned sitting there. Because that old Jacob would have given up. He would have been conniving. He would have did a trick. But this new Jacob said, I've been through too much to back out on God right now. I'm holding on. And he holding on. Fuck out there and know that it's time to just hold on because I know sooner or later God's going to bless me. But here's the first one. The first one you need to understand is 1 John 2.16. You better learn. Here's the first big battle. You better learn. It says, all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The first thing you have to conquer is this old flesh. It will get you in trouble. Your flesh, you got to fight. Not having your flesh in control. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I know you spiritual well and all that stuff, but that flesh will rear up anytime, and we want to make sure the flesh doesn't make us miss our blessing. Because here's what the flesh does it feels good while you go through it. You know what I'm talking about? The flesh says, We can get to our dreams that God has for us. I can get to those same dreams drinking and drugging. And you know, out there doing a little sex, I can I make myself happy. The flesh saying, if we get happy, we can get to our dreams. And the flesh sits there and lie to you. Now, after you get strung out, after you get hooked, the flesh will look at you because it has no answers. And you'll find yourself down in the dumps. Just like the young man that was giving a testimony at Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, when I graduated from Rutgers, I had an MBA. I knew by 30 I was going to be rich. I was going to be a market analyst. I had my life together. But then I started going to the parties and I started drinking. He said, and then I found myself more times than not picking myself up off the bathroom floor, throwing up. And I found out I no longer could do my job. So I'm sitting there and everything I had could not get me through. And not only that, for the young lady who said, I knew I was God's gift to me. I had it going on. I was smart. I was beautiful. I was intelligent. And said, I knew every man wanted me. But then, baby after baby, and people leaving. Here's what she said. She said, true testimony. She said, I found myself selling myself in an alley for cocaine. Because I got to the point where the flesh had reared up and taken over and all of that beauty, none of that meant anything. All I'm telling you is the first major battle we have to conquer is not let this flesh, it will sell you under, it'll make you give up, it'll make you want to run away. Not only the flesh, you must learn the second major battle is not just the flesh. The second major battle is trying to have cheap religion. You know what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9? He said that the only way you can be my disciple is to take up your cross and follow me. Watch me, y'all. This is good. Here's what he's saying. He's saying that there's too many saints out there. You want the religion, but you don't want the work. You want the blessing, but you don't want it to cost you anything. You want to serve God on your turn. We're, I'm going to tell you something. All of us who found ourselves victorious have had ourselves strung out. We were up on the wall and could not come down. We found ourselves doing what we didn't want to do because we knew that God was the best thing that ever happened in my life. You got to get to the point where you sell out. Here's what God said. Be you holy for I am holy. Here's what I'm telling you. Anybody who made it, anybody who got blessed is because they learned how to conquer that second battle of the fight in that fight for holiness. No, honey, you can't live halfway. No, brother, you can't live halfway. You got to be all the way. You're going to keep having problems because you sold half your soul to the devil and you want to walk in half of God and you want God to give you all the blessings. And then finally, you got to get to where Jacob is right now. So now here's the three major. You got to make sure you understand how to conquer that battle of your flesh. You better make now wait a minute. These are lifelong battles, so nobody feel bad. I'm not saying you conquered it, you never have a problem. 
If you find somebody that's spiritual, they're lying to you. All of us have to wrestle with that flesh. Not only that, also I'm telling you, make sure you don't have that halfway religion. Sooner or later in your life, you're going to find a day when you have to surrender. But the worst one is the last one. This is where Jacob was. Now the text says there was a man wrestling with, with Jacob. But we know the text it says God was wrestling with Jacob. What I didn't understand is how God could have Jacob, please don't miss this, in pain and still make him struggle. God, I'm already in pain. It's unfair. I see you blessing everybody else. Why is my life here? Why, do I, why am I the one always going through this stuff? All I'm saying is that last one is the one that is the worst because that is the devil who is scrupulous. It is the devil trying to destroy you and kill you. And here is what God did. God put pain on Jacob and wrestled with him so he could see if he was going to give up, if he was going to go back. You know why God makes you struggle even in pain? Is because God is making sure that you know where you are. And as soon as Jacob said, I won't let go till you bless me. Can I move on somebody? But there's power in those words. And I'm glad the Bible said Jacob was all alone. Don't you worry because we're not in church now. The strongest place for you to tell God, I'm not going to let go till you bless me, is when you're all alone in your bedroom, when you're all alone and pain is creeping in. When you're all alone, you ought to tell God, uh -huh. I'm going to struggle, and I'm going to keep struggling till I get my blessing. Let's close this up. We found out that Jacob found himself alone wrestling with God. And I told you earlier, it's a blessing that God wrestles and don't throw us away. Oh, come on, that's the point right there. I just can't preach on it because I'm trying to get out of here. Isn't it something that God said, I'm going to keep you, even though you haven't been wrestling real good. I'm never going to let you go. That reminds me of this man who walked in to a church and everybody was praying. And he went to the altar and some one person was speaking in tongues on this side. He went over here to the altar. One person was hollering, hallelujah, and, and I thank you, God, and I'm strong. And then he got to the back of the crowd and there was this young man and another older man sitting next to him saying, well, Lord, uh, I left done what I should have got done, and I don't do what I should do, but I'm still coming to you. The man threw his hands up and said, I just found my crowd. See, some of y'all, I'm not in that crowd that always holy. I'm not in the crowd that never mess up. I found a crowd that says, even though I don't do what I'm supposed to do all the time, I'm still reaching for God. Is there anybody out there like me? I know I ain't done everything I'm supposed to do, but well, you know what? Wake me up and find me reaching for God. Try to get me, drag me away from God's word. I'm not going anywhere. So I found the crowd that I want to be in. Jacob said, no, nah, I won't let go till you bless me. Here's what he said, last point. The man looked at him and said, what is your name? Here's the test. After all he'd been through, he said, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Jacob means trickster, supplanter, thief. It, it has all the evil connotations. Not when he was born because God knew who he was. It's what he had made it. Come on, come on. Let me preach that. You know that even though you had a destiny, you were born. How many of us know we made some stuff in our life that shouldn't be there? So Jacob said, Jacob, here's what he did. God was overjoyed. He was ecstatic. God said, you just owned up. He was waiting on Esau's brother. He was going to come clean with Esau. No matter what happened, he was getting ready to change. God said, you know what? You just owned up to who you are. The first thing you got to remember is the reason God grabs you in pain and the reason he asks you your name is because he's trying to get you to see who you really are. Oh, somebody, this is shouting point right here. Here's what God is saying. I treat you that way because I got more for you and there's more to you and you have more favor. I want to give you more peace. I know you see all the other people running around. Look
looking like they're scot-free, but they're not the ones I came after. You're special to me. I got more for you. You know I've been holding you up when nobody else was there for you. I got more for you, so you got to go through more. But in the end, keep struggling, because your blessing is coming. What do you mean by that? Here it is, Daniel. Go to the lion's thing. When you come out, I'm going to raise you up. Second most important in the kingdom. Here it is. Joseph, go to the prison. When you come out, what they meant for your evil going to be turned around for your good. All I'm saying is, Caleb, keep calling for your mountain. Even though giants are in your mountain, God is saying you'll have the power to come. I feel my help coming off. Somebody ought to realize the reason God said, what's my name, is I finally owned up to who I am and who I'm supposed to be. Come on, Oregon, it's taking me out right here. Come on, watch this. God has more. More peace. More blessing. He looked at it. You know what, Jacob? Forget your past. Your name is no longer Jacob, but it's Israel. Because you have prevailed with God and man. Listen to me, y'all. One of these days when your struggling is going on, you got to come face to face with God. Face to face. Just as you are. All your sin, naked as you are. You got to come face to face. And you know what he'll do? He'll grab you. He'll hold you. And he'll make sure that you know. Because you struggle, we're ready to come clean. Here is your blessing. You are now the patriarch to carry the covenant. My brothers and sisters, the power in struggling, the value of your struggle, don't you quit. That this is relevant for these times because people want to lose their mind. But you need to realize that struggle brings the blessing. I want to pray for you now. Will you bow with me? The Spirit of God is telling me there's somebody out there that needs to know what Jacob knew. I, I like the fact that the text said that he left with a limp. <laughs> Those of us who aren't going anywhere, you may not be able to see our limp, but I got one. Can, can, can you tell you? I got a limp. There was a day when God woke me till I got to the point where I knew I wasn't going to serve anybody with him. And you know what happens? Every time I get all big and bad and want to step out, whew, that lip reminds me. You better stay with God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you today. Somebody was at the end of their rope, but you want to let them know, no, keep struggling. The blessing's coming. And even after he became Israel, had power with God. He still has struggles. But every time he had a struggle, he did what the Jeffersons did. He didn't move out. He moved up. Some of us need to quit moving out and start moving up. Hang in there, my brother and sister. Just because you're struggling, God's going to reward you and your blessing is coming. Amen. It's Pastor Duncans. I hope you enjoyed this word coming from the heart of God. I want someone to know that no matter how bad your life gets, if you keep struggling, struggling, your blessing is going to come. Let's pray. If you're not saved, pray this prayer with me. Come on. Come on. Get ready. Don't be, don't be ashamed. This is how all of us came. Say, Lord God, I thank you for dying on the cross in my place. I receive that sacrifice and now I am saved amen if you prayed that prayer then you now have a new life call us um, go on our website you can become a virtual member but also we'll send you some information if you receive the Lord by watching this message also you ought to go to our website and see some of the exciting things that's happening in Shiloh we're in the midst of doing our free COVID testing 
We have things going on for our couples trying to keep our marriages strong. And every week we're feeding people. I hope you haven't missed it on the news. There are people who are hungry. And we're trying to make sure we do our part. Join in with us. And again, I thank you. You didn't have to, but you decided to listen to us today. And we give God all the glory and honor. May the Lord continue to bless you. Oh, if you need prayer, call. We got a prayer line. Somebody will call you back and give you prayer. In Jesus' name, have a great day. Amen. Take it to him and leave it there. I was down with a no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living just existing well and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free I tried it for myself and now I know what he did